Hello! Welcome to an adventure. Uh, let me make sure the captions are on, because... I forgot to do that. Um, and if somebody in chat would just confirm for me that you can hear me, that would be lovely. Um, let me say uh, welcome, uh, Key Squared and Lord Portico and Fluidan and Philip. Hello and welcome. Uh, captions should be a go. Um, Welcome to Archival Adventures. I'm Anthony Wright de Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. And this is our weekly Twitch stream from Special Collections and University Archives. Um, I'm going to start the same way that we always do, reading out the Land and Labor Acknowledgement from Virginia Tech, uh, just to keep it out there and make sure we're paying attention. Um, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of native nations from their lands, both locally and in western territories. We understand that honoring native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved Black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to utprosim that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So thank you for uh, letting me read that at the top of every stream. Today we will be looking at materials related to the Hubble telescope. Um, so, oh Hannah, thank you so much for the resubscription. It's good to see you back. Um, 11 months, wow. Um, so if you haven't been watching the skies or, you know, watching NASA's absolutely stellar science communication team um, telling the world about the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, the James Webb Telescope launched on December 25th. And as of four days ago, on the 8th of January, they had fully deployed all of their sun shields and mirrors, so it is fully configured, fully deployed, and it's just on its way to that L2 Lagrange point where it will start viewing the distant universe for us in infrared. Uh, we here have a number of NASA-related collections in our archives. We don't have anything on the James Webb Space Telescope, unsurprisingly. But we do have a number of items about the Hubble Space Telescope, the sibling and still operating space telescope that views in uh, visual light spectra. And so in honor of the successful launch and deployment of the James Webb Space Telescope, I decided that today we would devote our stream to looking at its sibling, the Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, so yeah, that is, yay space, um, that is the plan today. Unfortunately, um, the room that I am in is not as cold as space. Uh, it is somewhat warm here today outside and I am in a sauna right now. So if I take slightly more frequent breaks to sip water, that's why. Usually I can go through most of the stream with maybe one or two sips of water. I am sweating quite a lot because it is very hot in here. Uh, <laughs> but, um, so one second while I take a sip of water. <laughs> so they're heating the building as though it is minus 50 degrees outside, but it's closer to plus 50 degrees outside. That is um, Fahrenheit units that I'm referencing there because my brain doesn't automatically make that calculation. But suffice to say, it's, sure, it's, it's cool, but warm enough that you could walk outside without long sleeves. But they're heating it as though you needed to have 
uh, Antarctic wear on to survive. So a little bit, um, a little bit warm. Anyway, uh, how about we take a look at what we've got and um, so the way that this works, if you're new to the stream, if you've not been here before, um, I have pulled materials that through our finding aids or catalog, I have identified as relevant to today's topic. And most of them I have never seen. Um, so what we do is I show them on a document camera on stream and you have the opportunity to ask questions. I will look up information on the internet about the items that we're looking at. Um, and we're gonna learn about them at the same time because um, while archivists like myself are often subject matter experts in certain materials, there is no way that any one archivist will know everything about every item in the collection that they work at, um, especially at an institution the size of Virginia Tech. We have tons of collections and most of our archivists have never seen the materials that are in them. Uh, somebody years ago brought them in, described them, and unless there's a particular reason that we pulled them out, we don't know they're there. Um, that's what finding aids are for. And so we're going to discover things together. It is it, indeed Key Squared. It is an adventure, an archival adventure, um, hence the name of our show. Uh, so what we are starting with today uh, let me actually switch us over so that you can see the documents. Um, and doo -ba doo here we go. Um, we are going to start with the Everett B. Clark collection. So how about I look up a little bit about Everett Clark and we find out who he is. Um, So our finding aids are located on a website called Virginia Heritage. Uh, it is vaheritage.org. And that's where I'm going to go. I'm going to pull up the finding aid for the Everett B. Clark papers. And we're going to find out who this person was and why he has this folder with this lovely image of the Hubble telescope. Um, one second while I find where we're going. Oh, come on. And so his name is not Everett, it is Everett, E-V-E-R-T. So if you're going out to look for the finding aid, it's E-V-E-R-T and last name is Clark, C-L-A-R-K. Um, ooh, Lord Portico, thank you for dropping the Virginia Heritage link in the, the chat on Rogan27. Let me just drop that in over here as well. Boop, boop. Nope. <laughs> Sorry, my brain uh, typed that wrong. <gasps> Can't delete my own comment. Um, anyway, we are we are streaming to two channels at the same time. Um, so I just want to make sure that if links get dropped, they end up in both places. Um, okay, so Everett B. Clark papers. Uh, these papers cover the time period of 1949 to 1988. So let's see, um, biographical information. That's, I think, what we're most interested in. Who was Everett Clark? Because we can look at the materials, but we don't know who he was. Uh, so we want to find that out. Um, Everett B. Clark was born in Gainesville, Georgia on October 15, 1926. He served in the U.S. Navy from 1944 to 1946 and graduated from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill in June 1947 with an A.B. in Journalism and Naval Science and Tactics. From June 1947 to October 1948, Clark worked as a reporter, state editor, and features editor for the Durham, North Carolina Morning Herald. 
In November 1948, he became a reporter for the Washington, D.C. Daily News, working also as assistant city editor and aviation editor for that newspaper through December 1955. In January 1956, Clark began working at Aviation Week magazine, serving at various times as its Washington bureau chief, space technology editor, the first space editor in the magazine's history, and military editor. He joined the Washington Bureau of the New York Times in September 1963 as a science correspondent specializing in aviation and space stories. In June 1968, he joined Newsweek magazine in its Washington Bureau as a science correspondent, again specializing in aviation and space. He also covered the Watergate scandal for Newsweek from its inception to its conclusion. From April 1978 until his death, Clark was a technical editor for Business Week and other magazines connected with the McGraw-Hill World News Bureau in Washington. He died on July 7, 1988. Um, yeah, and so his papers contain many of his notes, files, and much of his correspondence for stories and research projects throughout his career. And so there is uh, one folder from his collection that seemed of interest for today's topic, which was a folder just simply called Space Telescope 1982 to 85. Um, and when I pulled up that folder, I discovered this folder inside that has this lovely picture of the Hubble Space Telescope. And I thought, this seems rather relevant. And so I set it aside for today. So we're gonna look inside this Hubble Space Telescope folder um, and see what we can learn. Uh, so just looking at the folder itself to start, we've got NASA and the European Space Agency both listed on the folder. Uh, the cover is a model by Lockheed Missiles and Space Company with a background by Cal California Institute of Technology. So this is a composite image of the model and a background image. Um, and then on this side we have, whoops, sorry, I'm working with a document camera and sometimes opening folders, I bump the camera. Um, Space, Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland, operated by, for NASA by Aura. So <laughs> that's the folder itself. We will look at the contents of the folder too. Um, let's see. So this is an article from July 1982 from Scientific American about the Space Telescope. The largest astronomical telescope designed to operate beyond the interfering effects of the Earth's atmosphere is scheduled to be transported into orbit by the U.S. Space Shuttle in 1985. Um, and so there's an article here. I'm just going to read the highlighted parts if I can make out what the highlights are. The, the highlighter has faded somewhat. You may be able to see faint bits of yellow on your screen. Um, the plans for the Space Telescope have been developed by a large number of scientists and engineers working for almost a decade under the supervision of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. The prime contractors charged with the actual construction are the Perkin Elmer Corporation, responsible for the telescope itself, and the Lockheed Missiles and Space Company, Incorporated, responsible for the supporting spacecraft system and for the integration of the components into a working whole. The total cost of the project is currently estimated at $750 million. That was again in 1982. The projected lifetime of the space telescope, 15 years. So the fact that it is still up there and still in operation means that it has well exceeded its stated life, uh, projected lifespan. Ooh, and we have a raid coming in. Welcome 16-Bit Eric. Welcome everybody. Welcome League of Whimsy to Archival Adventures. Um, thank you so much, Eric, for bringing your community over. I hope that you had a great stream today. Um, this show is Archival Adventures. This is uh, a weekly show that I do from the Special Collections and University Archives here at Virginia Tech. And today we are looking at materials related to the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, the, uh, actually, let me just talk to you directly for a second. Um, four days ago, 
the James Webb Space Telescope finished its final deployment of its last set of mirrors, and it's traveling on its way to the L2 Lagrange point where it will start imaging the galaxy for us using infrared. But its sibling, the Hubble Space Telescope, is still in operation, and we have some materials here in our archives about the Hubble Space Telescope, so in honor of the James Webb, Webb Telescope's successful launch and deployment, we're looking at materials about the Hubble Space Telescope today, and I hope that you'll hang out and um, learn with us as we look and see what archival materials um, are in our collections about Hubble and kind of see what we can learn about the two telescopes, why they're out there, and um, you know, how all of that worked. Oh, Obi-Wan Pez, thank you so much for the follow. Um, Oh, hi, was not worth it. Uh, hi, Vampire Vaxel Dan. Hi, just here for coffee. Hi, Eagle Sight. Um, welcome everybody in. So it's really good to see you. So we were just looking at, uh, right now we're looking at materials from Everett B. Clark, who was a reporter um, for various uh, news sources. Um, seems like uh, spent a lot of time at Newsweek. Um, and he had a folder on the Space Telescope. So that is where we're starting with um, Everett Clark's material. Um, so <laughs> this is a photocopy of a magazine article right now. So not great image quality on this one. Uh, the first director of the Institute is Ricardo Giacconi, who led the scientific teams for the highly successful Uhuru and Einstein X-ray satellites which, if you have seen the stream before, you will know that we looked at uh, Marjorie Rhodes Townsend's papers about the Uhuru satellite launch um, just a couple months ago. So uh, that, if you want to check out the VODs for that, it is on the Virginia Tech University Library's um, YouTube channel. You can go back and there's uh, two episodes about Marjorie Rhodes Townsend. Um, where we did touch on the Uhuru, sat Uhuru satellite launch. Um, let's see. Primary mirror. So th this is going to give us a little bit of information just about the telescope itself. Um, some good information here that'll be good for us to know. Um, <laughs> you don't know how you missed following prior to now? Well, it's never too late, so thank you. Uh, the primary mirror for the Space Telescope was photographed at the Wilton, Connecticut plant of the Perkin Elmer Corporation just after its front surface had been coated with a reflective film of aluminum three millionths of an inch thick, followed by a protective layer of magnesium fluoride a millionth of, a, of an inch thick. The mirror, which is made of fused silica glass with an extremely low coefficient of thermal expansion, is 2.4 meters, 94 inches, in diameter and weighs about 1,800 pounds. It consists of a lightweight cellular core approximately 10 inches thick, sandwiched between two end plates and about an inch thick. Some 200 pounds of material were removed from the front plate in the course of the 28 months of grinding and polishing required to give the surface its proper figure, which is that of a concave hyperboloid. The masked man seen enlarged in reflection is standing next to the photographer some 60 feet in front of the mirror. Uh, Another technician, also wearing a mask and a special suit to maintain the cleanliness of the mirror's surface, is at the right. A metal plate temporarily covers the hole in the center of the mirror through which light from the telescope's secondary mirror will pass. So, um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on the Scientific American article. If you want to read the entire thing, uh, this is... July 1982, Scientific American. You can probably get a copy from your local library or um, local academic library. Um, so that, that's the first thing in Everett Clark's folder here. But the thing that really caught my eye, oh, we've got Sky and Telescope Magazine, uh, which there were a couple of collections that had issues of this and I didn't pull all of them. This one just happened to be already in this folder. Um, and this happens to be the April 1985 issue of Sky and Telescope magazine with an image of the Hubble Space Telescope on the front. 
It is a gorgeous telescope. I'm trying not I'm trying to eliminate some of the glare and how you see it, but um, <clears throat> so this this magazine issue is the Space Telescope Special. Perched on the side of a small valley on the Homewood campus of Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, is the Space Telescope Science Institute. So that is uh, one of the places primarily responsible for dealing with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, let's see. Here's a picture of Richard Giacconi, the director of the Space Telescope Science Institute. And here we have Ethan Schreier, the head of the Institute's Operations and Data Management Board branch. Uh, try and let you see. This is all in black and white. The entrance foyer, dominated by this model of the Space Telescope. I'm not going to spend tons of time on this. There's other more interesting things. I just thought I would just show you a little bit here. Ooh, this one's kind of interesting. <clears throat> Just looking at the image, a, lar or a 1972 impression of the Large Space Telescope in orbit above the Earth with a space shuttle orbiter in the distance at right. NASA did not get co congressional approval for the project and a scaled down version of that until 1977. So this was what was planned um, that ended up being scaled down and eventually becoming the Hubble Space Telescope. I was not familiar with that. Honestly, this was 82 to 85. I was pretty young at the time. By the time NASA had asked aerospace firms to bid on its 2.4 meter space telescope <clears throat> in 1976, the design had been largely frozen. The team of Eastman Kodak and iTech Corporation bid for the optical system, uh, which is the top here, but lost out to Perkin Elmer Corporation uh, at the bottom. In a parallel competition, Lockheed, Boeing Aerospace, and uh, Martian Marietta Aerospace all bid, or Martin Marietta Aerospace, all bid for the support systems module surrounding the optics, and Lockheed won that contract. <clears throat> right. The thing that I, that when I glanced at the folders and I was like, what am I going to pull? What am I going to pull? I found this in the Everett Clark papers and I think it is absolutely amazing and we're going to take a look at this today. And then I've got some images, I've got a speech from Michael Collins, I've got a couple other things that I pulled today. I remember seeing some of those drawings when I was a kid in school about the amazing future of space astronomy. Well, and <clears throat> it was so revolutionary at the time. And now we look at it and we're like, the Hubble, is that thing still up there? Um, a lot of the time. But the James Webb, I think, has really sparked renewed interest and, and fascination. Um, but the Hubble is still there and still going strong. So, and there's actually a really good um, tweet thread on the Hubble Space Telescope's um, Twitter feed all about the James Webb Space Telescope and kind of their similarities and differences. And, and I think I may, I may, sh may share that in just a minute, but um, <clears throat> the Advanced X-ray Astrophysics Facility. Oh, this one's going to be um, somewhat difficult. Let me see what I can do. I can go this way, and then I can do this. Nope. This. Aha! Success! <laughs> um, only it doesn't work for me. One second. <laughs> Let me go full face while I adjust the camera so that it is a little bit easier on you all. <clears throat> this should work. Yeah, this, this is going to work. All right. There we go. Advanced X-ray Astrophysics Facility. 
Determine the nature of celestial objects. Characterize the physical processes that occur in space. Understand the history and evolution of the universe and test the fundamental laws of physics. Look at the art! This, so, just a few minutes ago I was talking about how um, NASA had excellent science communication around the James Webb Space Telescope launch. And this is going back into the 80s. And they still had excellent science communication. This is excellent science communication. So you all are seeing the illustrated page. The, this page here has like all the text, but there's this wonderful illustration to go with the text. Our highest priority new observatory. X-rays are produced by violent, energetic, and explosive phenomena in the universe. The Advanced X-Ray Astrophysics Facility, AXAF, is an orbiting observatory designed to view these X-rays. The National Academy of Sciences Survey Committee on Astronomy and Astrophysics has recommended it AXAF as the number one priority among all major new uh, astronomy programs. The scientific importance of AXAF was also highlighted by the Academy's Survey Committee on Physics. So, I don't know the details. Um, The Hubble Space Telescope is the only name that I know the Space Telescope by. The illustration here, that is the shape of the Hubble Space Telescope. So I, I personally am not 100% clear and I would appreciate if anybody knows, um, otherwise I will find out, is the Advanced X-ray Astrophysics Facility the same thing as the Hubble Telescope? That's just... A, 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 another name for it? Am I correct in that? Axaf became Chandra. How is that related to Hubble? Um... So yes, the Chandra X-ray Observatory, flagship space class, uh, flagship class space telescope, launched aboard the Space Shuttle Columbia during STS-93 by NASA in 1999. So this would be like the second generation. So this would be a similar. Chandra is one of the great observatories along with the Hubble Space Telescope, Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, and the Spitzer Space Telescope. Got it. Okay, so this is basically a sibling of Hubble. They were built as part of the same mega project. Awesome. So I'm going to share this. I know it's not technically Hubble now uh, because it is um, the Chandra ta Space Telescope, but I think it's still worth looking at. Seeing the universe in X-rays. AXAF is the premier observatory for X-ray astronomy. Major advances in capability. Um, spectral coverage two times. Effective area four times. Mission duration six times. Angular resolution eight times, sensitivity to point sources 100 times, and maximum spectral sensitivity 1,000 times over the HEAO2. Improvement factor over capability of HEAO2, which is the Einstein Observatory. Advances in measurement capability inevitably lead to advances in knowledge. Exploring the universe across the spectrum. AXAF is the only great observatory that can view the universe in X-rays. Normal stars, neutron stars, black holes, globular clusters, galaxies, quasars, and galaxy clusters. I just, they got a comic illustrator to do these wonderful graphics and I think it's amazing. They're really good. AXAF science in a broad context. AXAF is a versatile instrument for basic physics research in the laboratory of space. Particle physics, neutron stars, atomic physics, supernovae rev remnants, 
plasma physics, clusters of galaxies, relativity theory, black holes, and cosmology, quasars. And Chandra has another notable distinction. For once, NASA didn't name the orbiter for a white guy. Indeed, um, the, the Chandra telescope is named after an Indian, um, uh, boop, 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 uh, Indian American astrophysicist, Subramanian uh, Chandra Shikhar. And I probably uh, stumbled a little bit on that name, but um, yeah. What can AXAF reveal? Neutron stars, black holes, supernovae, stellar coronae, quasars, diffuse X-ray background. How big and how old is the universe? AXAF provides an accurate new approach to measuring the Hubble constant. Uh, radio observatories measure microwave radiation. Uh, speaking of radio observatories, Just because I happen to know this is here, and it is the only thing that I have in this collection uh, to show. And here we have a reference to radio observatories. I have a photo of an actual radio observatory. Come on, out of the mylar. Uh, this is the Howard E. Tattle Radio Telescope of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory at Green Bank, West Virginia, uh, one of the largest equatorially mounted radio telescopes in the world, ranking among the top tourist attractions in West Virginia. Um, and so this is an actual radio telescope that is uh, set up in Green Bank, West Virginia. Um, it has some uh, special meaning for me because when I was very little, like two years old, I lived quite near it. <laughs> and so it's just a thing, like I don't remember living there, but I know I lived by this radio telescope. Um, and I, I, it was um, somewhat interesting many years later when the military base that we lived on was uh, put on sale and we saw like the the realtor ad for it um, but they're one of the unique things that I do know about that area was um, because the radio telescope is located there they have um, restrictions on certain kinds of technology that can be used in the area so there's basically a radio quiet zone around it where things like microwaves and cell phones and things like that. Um, there's a geographic area where they're restricted around the radio telescope because the emissions from devices would actually interfere with the operation of the radio telescope. Um, hang on, I have to put this glove back on. Trip to Green Bank. Uh, best scouts field trip ever, awesome. I haven't been back there, honestly, since I was very little and lived there. Um, so I haven't really been to that area in like 40 years, but, um, but yeah, so that is, they, they actually have a really great illustration of what it looks like because it, it very much looks as illustrated. Um, that, uh, that photograph is from our Earl, Pal Earl Palmer papers, um, which is, it has a very large collection of various photographs. Um, anyway, the radio observatories measure microwave radiation, uh, which is, uh, they get blue shifted microwave photons, apparently. Uh, AXAF measures temperature and density of hot gases. X-rays from hot gas, blue shifted microwave photons, microwave background, all right, an accurate new approach to measuring the Hubble constant. Where is the dark matter? We still don't know the answer to this one. Um, AXAF detects the presence of dark matter in a variety of circumstances. Within galaxies, within clusters of galaxies, interstellar gas, interstellar black holes, X-ray corona, in low mass stars. We're still not 100% certain on, on uh, 
dark matter, but we definitely know more today than we did before these telescopes launched. How did quasars form and evolve? How do they produce so much energy? AXAF will look back in time to see quasars in earlier epochs and will study the high energy component of quasar emission. What kinds of black holes exist? With AXAF, we can detect black hole candidates and determine their priority or properties. We can't determine their priorities. We don't know if they're sentient or what they would want if they were. Uh, we can determine their properties, though. Um, <laughs> binary star system with black hole and accretion disk. Isolated stellar black hole, quasar nucleus. So we, here we have the companion star, the black hole, and the accretion disk around it. These are... I really like this illustrative style to kind of communicate this science stuff. Science stuff. Uh, what produces the X-ray background? AXAF will bring the X-ray background into sharp focus, enabling us to determine and examine its composition. Discrete sources made up of known categories and entirely new classes? Discrete sources plus a truly diffuse component. AXAF observed background intensity. Contribution of known sources. What remains after stars explode? AXAF gives us our most detailed look at supernovae. <laughs> I just love all the illustrations with the question marks because it's like, these are what we're trying to find out. This is why these missions exist. Priorities. Launch. Radiate. <laughs> How do other stars compare with the sun? AXAF measures the X-ray characteristics of thousands of stars of all types. Uh, and so there's this lovely little um, scale here of they've got the from the white stars up to the, the red stars, and you've got the old stars that are at the, like the white dwarfs, and then you've got the red subdwarfs, and you've got all of these like yellowish hues. They're pointing out where our star is. These are all main sequence stars here. Then you've got the subgiants and the giants and the supergiants, which are very young stars. So the teeny tiny little white ones, they're old. The really big red ones, they're young. And since we're kind of an orangish yellow, we're on the younger side of the spectra. But you can see here, based on the main sequence, we're a little over halfway through the main sequence, according to this illustration. Do exotic particles exist? AXAF may detect evidence for the existence of cosmic strings and exotic particles, such, such as axions and monopoles in neutron stars. So I don't actually know whether they have, because I haven't followed this particular telescope. I've, I've been more interested in the pretty, pretty pictures. But um, if anybody does know, I, feel free to share. Making use of America's resources. Um, Shuttle unplanned servicing, shuttle launch, scientific community, communications, space station. Let's see. Creating X-ray images. AXAF exploits individual detection of X-rays for simplified observatory design and operation. Ah, yes. Okay, so this is kind of showing how they would get uh, sort of the the visual images that we would look at. And this is going to be similar, actually, to what James Webb does. Um, so you've got your visible light image, and you've got your X-ray image, because this one operates in X-ray, whereas James Webb in, operates in infrared. Um, but you'll get your visible light image, and then you've got your X-ray image, and they composite those together to make an image of what's there. so that we have a visual to appreciate and study and understand and kind of get our brains around what's there. Because despite whether our eyes could actually see it in reality, um, having a visual to look at helps us interpret what we're seeing and understand the universe better. 
Axaf Optics and Focal Plane Instruments, X-Ray Camera and Spectrometer, Charge Coupled Device, Crystal spect Spectrometer, Quantum Calorimeter, Grazing Incidence Mirrors, and Micro X-Ray Camera. The one that I'm curious about here that, and, and again, this is the first time I'm seeing this stuff and I'm not an expert on this type of material. I do not know the answers. I'm willing to accept information from chat if you have it. Um, but this would be the kinds of things that if I was really working with this material and, and doing um, some research or something, these are kind of the questions that spring out to me as I'm looking at it that I would want to dig a little bit further. Um, I don't know when it comes to an X-ray telescope what a calorimeter is used for. A calorimeter would be a, a, a tool for measuring caloric ex, uh, like calories, um, which is a unit of energy. But I just, I don't understand personally how a calorimeter is used with regard to an X-ray telescope. So I would be very curious to learn about that. Hi, I'm Puddle Glum, how are you? So good that you got the afternoon off and you can actually be here this week. Welcome in, it's good to see you. Uh, orbital servicing guarantees a long-lived AXAF mission and maximum scientific results. So they're able to service it with the space station. Seizing the opportunity now! 1962, the discovery of first X-ray source. 1960s, there were rockets. 1970s, Uhuru, the SAS-1. Uh, which, as I mentioned before, we did talk about a bit in our stream on Marjorie Rhodes Townsend. 1971, OSO-7. 1975, SAS-3. We also talked about SAS-3 in our stream on Marjorie Rhodes Townsend. OSO-8. 1978, HEAO-2. 1977 was HEAO-1. Now, AXAF! Um, and actually now, James Webb Space Telescope! Woo! Um... This is so cool! And graphic design and illustration by Brian O'Brien. Um, Brian O'Brien, you did an amazing job. Thank you so much for your wonderful science illustrations in this little book. Um, I saw this and I was like, I have to share this one on stream. It's amazing. It's an example of NASA's excellent science communication and uh, it's absolutely spectac spectacular. Calorimeter primarily helps with measuring heat and heat capacity, so without knowing much more than that, it seems like it would be a useful thing to have. Thank you, I am Puddle Glum. That is helpful context. Ooh, hi, Wannabe Sayuri. Thank you so much for your resubscription. Seven months, amazing. Welcome back. Um, yeah, today we are we're focused on um, mostly the Hubble Space Telescope. We the book that we were just looking at was the Chandra Space Telescope. Um, but it was in a folder about space telescopes in a folder that had a picture of the Hubble on it. Although now that I think about it, maybe it was a picture of the Chandra since they're basically identical. Eh, it doesn't matter. It was fun and interesting. But the next, next we definitely have the Hubble telescope to look at because this folder is labeled Hubble telescope. Uh, but, Let's see, um, let me look up who this folder, or let me look up the finding aid for the collection this folder is from, and we can talk about who this material came from, and then we'll look at the material. Uh, 2003-061. All right, so this one is from the Michael Collins collection, James Dean resource material. Um, so we've talked about Michael Collins on stream before. Michael Collins was born in Italy. Uh, he was an astronaut. Uh, <laughs> Collins was originally scheduled to be a member of the Apollo 8 flight crew. He needed back surgery, which forced his reassignment to a later mission. It put him on the main crew of Apollo 11. Um, 
which is, of course, the first manned or st staffed uh, landing on the moon. Um, we all know Neil Armstrong and uh, Edwin Buzz Aldrin uh, because they're the ones that actually landed on the moon. Michael Collins was the astronaut who remained in the orbiter and was the first person to fly around the backside of the moon and be completely out of contact with the surface of the Earth. Um, and we have his papers here at Virginia Tech. Um, this collection in particular of his stuff is the James Dean Resource Collection. James Dean was born in Fall River, Massachusetts and attended the Swain School of Design in New Bedford, Massachusetts before eventually playing a key role in the creation of the NASA Art Program. He became the NASA Director of Films, Publications, and Television, then Founding Director of the Fine Arts Program at NASA from 1961 to 1974, after which serving as the Curator of Art at the National Air and Space Museum. And so this collection consists of reference material NASA artist James Dean used in producing the artworks for Michael Collins' book Liftoff, The Story of America's Adventure in Space. The bulk of the contents include NASA file photos, files from the 12 Gemini missions, the majority of Apollo missions, mostly 11, the Space Lab Project, the Hubble Telescope, Space Shuttle missions, the Challenger accident, and many other NASA-related subjects. Also included are photos from the Project Mercury missions, images of NASA aircraft, NASA promotional material, and photos of U.S. officials and NASA personnel. An original rough draft copy of Liftoff, divided by chapter, is included. Oh, Lord Portico, thank you. Yes, and, and once you've searched it and find it, uh, re removing your search term helps just make a cleaner link to the finding aid. Um, okay, I had meant to bring a light box with me today and I forgot. I have a low tech solution though, um, because the first thing in here is a glorious image, but it's not gonna show up without a background behind it. Um. And actually, for everybody on the VTUL Studios channel, I should drop the link in there. Give me one second while I type real quick. Uh. Because at the moment, I don't know that I have an active mod on this channel to be able to go and find that link and drop it in for me. So it'll just take one second while I look this up. Uh, James Dean resource material. Let's remove the query. Come on. And copy the link and we'll just drop that in chat here for anybody who's watching on the VTUL Studios channel. That is where you can find the finding aid for the collection that the materials we are about to look at comes from. Um, all right. So you'll see me putting on and taking off these white cotton gloves. Um, and that really depends on the materials. We've had this discussion on stream before, but generally um, paper, we don't wear the gloves. Um, oftentimes the tactile dexterity reduction that the gloves gives you can actually um, cause more problems with dealing with especially fragile paper. Um, the other thing is the cotton gloves can actually catch on the rough edges of fraying paper and cause tearing. So oftentimes when we're working with paper materials especially, we don't want to wear the gloves because they can actually be more dangerous for the protection of the material. However, when looking at photographic materials, the oils on our hands become a concern and it's often better to go ahead and um, put on the gloves, sorry. And this is, this is absolutely a gorgeous, gorgeous picture. And I wish I had remembered the light box because if it was lit from behind, it would look 
so much more amazing. Um, let me see. I may have an option. This is going to be interesting if I can get it to do. No, nope, I just want. <laughs> this is this is. I have a slight problem in that everything is set to um, light mode. Or dark mode, I mean. No. Stop! <laughs> I know how to use my devices, really. Where was I? I wanted... We'll just switch it to light mode, and if I bring up just a brand new note. All right, this is, this is the best that I'm going to be able to do uh, to get this lit from behind because I forgot the, um, forgot the light box, but this works. <laughs> Having a tablet computer right next to me that I could do this. It's, it is a gorgeous, gorgeous image. Um, it, this is NASA 85HC399 um, from their image library. Now you see why I wanted to light it from behind. <laughs> um, I don't have the official caption for this image. Uh, I may be able to find that given a moment. Um, because like I said, NASA is expert at science communication. They provide the media images. They provide official captions for the images. Um, this is in a nice little like library checkout sleeve that says, uh, return transparencies to Audiovisual Branch, NAS National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Photo credit, NASA or National Aeronautics and Space Administration. This photograph is a government publication, not subject to copyright. It may not be used to state or imply the endorsement by NASA or by any NASA employee of a commercial project, process, or service, or used in any other manner that might mislead. Accordingly, it is requested that if this photograph is used in advertising, posters, books, etc., layout and copy be submitted to NASA prior to release. Um... I, I don't think it's an actual photograph, uh, uh, Sayuri. I believe that this is a composite of um, an image and a model. That would be my assumption uh, based on my understanding of um, how they produce these. Uh, let's see. NASA 85-399. Dash three nine nine. Let's put that in quotes and see if I can find an uh, official caption for it. It does not look like I can. Ooh, you know. So I'm just trying to do a general internet search. Usually photos like this, if they were actually a print and distributed uh, to media outlets, they would come with a sheet of captions along with it. Um, and this one, we just I just don't have the caption, so I don't know specifically um, how it would be captioned. If there's any government agency you would give copyright to, um, no, I love that um, if you visit the NASA Image of, Image of the Day catalog online, 
um, there's a brand new image every day and they're all copyright free because they are government property. Um, they are owned by the citizens of the United States and made available for free use of the world. Um, there, there are actual multiple, there are actually multiple NASA image galleries um, that are all public domain images and they are gorgeous, gorgeous images um, like this. Uh, so I don't know the specifics of this image um, other than that you have the lovely Hubble Space Telescope here in the foreground. I do believe that this is a model, an, an image of a model that was then composited over an image from space. Um, so we have the Hubble Space Telescope, we have the shuttle, and then we have the gorgeous, gorgeous blue Earth there with the sun in the background, and it's just a beautiful, striking, striking image. The copyrights are held by viewers like you. Uh, <laughs> not really. Um, yeah, free images, best images. <laughs> so this was exciting. This, this became the poster for today's stream, uh, the, the advertising graphic for today. Uh, this will be the, um, the default image for the uh, YouTube recording of today's episode will be the poster that has this image on it. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, so I did want to share that. Um, let me just put this back in its envelope. Uh, we have other art from this um, James Dean fellow though. And these I thought were excellent, excellent things to share. Um, ooh, ooh, bring that back. I literally, I had seen the one image, but I just found another one that I don't even know what it looks like yet. Um, And I found a slip with captions. So maybe we will get the caption for these after all. Come here. Because now we also have NASA 84HC577. And hopefully you can see that. Um, that is going to be, looks like we have an astronaut on a boom arm from the shuttle. Uh, doing some sort of work on a satellite here. Um, this had a slip in it, which does appear to be the press, press caption for the image for release, uh, November 21st, 1984, photo number 84H650. Nope, this is 84H577. <clears throat> And, and this has this wonderful notification here. No copyright protection is asserted for this photograph. If a recognizable person appears in this photograph, use for commercial purposes may infringe a right of privacy or publicity. It may not be used to state or imply the endorsement by NASA or any NASA employee of a commercial product, process, or service, or used in any other ma matter that might mislead. Accordingly, it is requested that if the photograph is used in advertising and other commercial promotion, layout and copy be submitted to NASA prior to release. Johnson Space Center, Houston, Texas. 51-A onboard scene, 75mm frame of Westar 6 retrieval. Astronauts Dale A. Gardner, left, and Joseph P. Allen, uh, the fourth. Left. <laughs> uh, there are two astronauts in this picture. Um, astronauts Dale A. Gardner, left, and Joseph P. Allen, the fourth worked together with Ann L. Fisher, not pictured, controlling re remote manipulator system RMS arm from Discovery's main cabin, uh, to bring Westar 6 PAM-D into Cargo Bay. Allen is on the mobile foot restraint, which is attached to the RMS end defector, while Gardner works to remove a stinger device from the now stabilized satellite. See also appropriation of likeness and publicity rights. Thank you, Lord Portico. 
Um, just, these are gorgeous. <laughs> like, really stunning photography. This one is a photograph. Uh, the other one was definitely a composite image, but this is definitely a photograph. Um, let's get it back. So we, I have it, it's inside of a protective mylar sleeve. Um, so once it goes back in the sleeve, I can take off my, my cotton glove. Um, With that, we also have a print of uh, the same photograph, a black and white print of it. I think it looks better in the, the color transparency. Um, but let's see. We've got a cardstock page. This looks like maybe the back cover of a magazine or something like that. Uh, NASA, National or Microgravity, a new tool for basic and applied research in space that has a lovely illustration of, um, looks like the cargo bay of the space shuttle open in space. So these are coming from the Jane Steen Resource collection. Um, again, he was an um, artist for NASA. Um, ah, this is from a brochure. This brochure highlights selected aspects of the NASA Microgravity Science and Applications Program. Interesting. Here we have a color print of uh, Gardner and Allen working on that satellite. But what really attracted me, oh wait, oh! Okay, so this is an image here of the Solar Max Repair, Solar Maximum Mission Satellite, shown here in the payload bay of the Space Shuttle. There's the satellite here, and that's the payload bay. Um, what really attracted me to this folder though was the drawings. So these, you can see, this is the um, final piece, right? This is the end result of art that this, that James Dean would have put together. These are the, the kinds of things that, that come from his work as an artist at NASA. Um, here we have drawings sketches of art for NASA. Um, zoom in a little bit here, because what you can see here is an image of the shuttle payload bay that we just saw. So we just saw, this is what the shuttle payload bay looks like, right? So this is a sketch of the shuttle payload bay there's an astronaut on the boom arm, which we just saw what that looks like too. Astronaut on the boom arm. And here's the Hubble Space Telescope. So setting up, we want an image that is the shuttle payload bay, astronaut on the boom arm, Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and then it looks like that was refined a little bit more, so we ended up with um, a, a more detailed sketch where we've got the payload bay with the astronaut inside, like what we saw here. Payload bay with the astronaut inside. Astronaut on the boom arm, so here again, You've got the boom arm present, and we know what an astronaut on the boom arm looks like from this. So combining those two images into a concept for a photo where we've got the payload bay with the astronaut here, the astronaut here on the boom arm, and then we've got the Hubble Space Telescope 
just behind the shuttle. Which I just think is, it's really cool because in this one folder you can see the component pieces of previous imaging that NASA has done and development towards a concept of an image that they want to, I, I assume that they want to have uh, for publicity purposes for the Hubble project. We don't have a completed image from that, or actually this um, wouldn't have been the Hubble project because these were from him working with Michael Collins on Michael Collins's book. So I don't know if the book has an image like that in it, but I, th I think it's really interesting to see how um, those multiple images were, were conceptually composited together into that sketch. So, let's see what other ones I have. I've got Philips Orbiting Telescope. Marjorie Rhodes Townsend, some mission reports from the Hubble stuff, Michael Collins' speech, and then some telescope-related stuff from Robert Marshak. Um, before we dive into the technical reports on missions, what if we... Hydrate, thank you, Lord Portico. What if we take a look at the tweets from the Hubble Space Telescope account where they talked about uh, the James Webb Telescope. Because I think that will inform what we're looking at. Um, <laughs> it's just gonna be one second while I get things uh, appropriately set so that I can make sharing the tweets on stream happen. Um, I need... I just have to get it so I can actually see the chat for the channel that I will be... <clears throat> for the computer. Words are functioning for me. There, okay, I can see the chat now. Um, and let me I'm just gonna find the tweet first find the tweets first uh, cuz I saw it and I was like this is amazing um, it was so cool seeing the 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 sibling talking about the new, the new telescope, I, I say sibling, they, I'm, they're siblings. All right, I believe this is, yes, this is what I wanted to find. So let me, let me see if this is gonna work. All right, you all should be able to see a web page now that is Twitter. Um, let me see if I can increase the size. Zoom? Maybe. Oh, it's just, oh. It's a web page, uh, spelled like the name of the telescope, yes. Um, so this is the, the official NASA Hubble telescope account. Have you heard the buzz? At NASA Webb's honeycomb like mirror unfolded and the telescope is fully deployed. Like Hubble, Webb is a reflecting telescope, meaning that it gathers light using huge mirrors rather than lenses. So how do the mirrors on Hubble and Webb compare? <clears throat> so this is an this image here is actually an image of the James Webb Space Telescope. Again, this is like that image that we saw a few minutes ago of the Hubble, uh, where this is a composite image of the model with an image of space that's been composited behind it. Um, 
to give a beautiful visual that inspires people to be very curious about space. Um, it's excellent work by the NASA artists there. Um, size. Webb's primary mirror stretches approximately 21 feet or 6.5 meters across, while Hubble's is approximately 8 feet or 2.4 meters across. That gives Webb more than six times the light collecting area than Hubble has. Um, Ooh, that's nice. Nice little rotating uh, illustration there. So Webb is definitely larger. <laughs> Six times the light collecting area. Despite its larger size, Webb will deliver about the same resolution in near infrared light as Hubble attains in visible light. The two telescopes will be able to double team their observations of objects to provide us with spectacular broad spectrum views. Look at the difference in size between the Hubble's main mirror and the James Webb main mirror. Hubble's primary mirror is made of one large piece of ultra low expansion glass that is coated with thin layers of aluminum and magnesium fluoride. Webb's 18 mirror segments are covered in a thin reflective layer of gold, which reflects infrared light more efficiently. Temperature. Hubble is optimized to observe ultraviolet and visible light, so its primary mirror doesn't have to be as cold as Webb's. But to detect faint infrared light, Webb's mirrors have to be around minus 364 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the image shows mirrors getting prepped for cryogenic testing. We'll leave you to reflect on all that. Hubble and Webb, with their complementary abilities to see across the electromagnetic spectrum, will work together to give us a more complete view of the universe. Um, and there is a link there where if you wanted to go and learn more, you can do so. Again, uh, these tweets are directly from at NASA Hubble on Twitter. Um, it is the official NASA Hubble Telescope um, Twitter account. And uh, yeah, they, I thought it was really cool that they were sharing information about um, kind of what are the main differences between the Hubble telescope and the uh, James Webb telescope. Um, so that thread is actually quite useful. A lot of people are really familiar with Hubble. And so um, communicating this and, and being like, hey, this is what's different. This is what's cool and new about the James Webb Space Telescope. I thought that was an excellent move with regard to science communication. Um, going to go ahead and switch us back to document view here so that we can continue looking. Uh, by point of reference, absolute zero is about minus 460 Fahrenheit. Thank you for that, Lord Portico. Um, so, let's do Michael Collins next because I believe the Marjorie Rhodes Towns and stuff we may have already looked at, uh, so I want to look at new stuff first. And I know we did not specifically look at this material from Michael Collins before. Um, I mentioned who Michael Collins was a little bit earlier in the stream. He was one of the three astronauts uh, on the Apollo 11 mission, although he was very heavily involved in many different parts of, of NASA, went on to be an administrator, uh, did lots of stuff. Um, I can get his full bio. I should do that rather than just trying to summarize and, and not spend the time. Um, do, do, do. Hello, computer. Hello, computer. Uh... You are connected to the internet. Will you load the page? One moment.
It does not want to load. <laughs> um, that's okay. I don't have to do it on there. I have multiple devices around me. I will look it up here. so that I can get biographical information to share with you about Michael Collins. All right. Okay. <clears throat> Pilot, astronaut, U.S. Assistant Secretary of State, National Air and Space Museum director and author, Michael Collins was born in Rome, Italy on October 31st, 1930. He graduated from St. Albans School in Washington, D.C. before attending the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, where he obtained a Bachelor of Science degree in 1952. Collins received an Air Force commission and, after pilot training, was assigned to Nellis Air Base for advanced training on the F-86 Sabre Jet. Upon completion of training, he was assigned to the 21st Fighter Bomber Wing, stationed in Victorville, California, and later France. In 1961, Collins completed test pilot school and was assigned to Edwards Air Force Base, where he tested experimental fighter jets. In the meantime, he had married Patricia Finnegan. Uh, the couple would have three children, Kathleen, Anne, and Michael. Interested in NASA's manned space program, Collins enrolled in the newly established Aerospace Pilot School in 1963. In October of that year, he was among the third group of astronauts selected by NASA. Collins served as a member of the backup crew for the Gemini 7 mission and as pilot of NASA's Gemini 10 mission, launched July 18, 1966, with Commander John Young. Among the mission's noteworthy accomplishments were the establishment of a new orbital altitude record, a rendezvous with an Agena target vehicle, and two spacewalks conducted by Collins. Due to the rotational basis on which astronauts were assigned to Apollo missions, Collins was originally scheduled to be a member of the Apollo 8 flight crew. He needed back surgery, however, or his needed back surgery, however, forced his reassignment to a later mission. The postponement placed Collins on the crew of Apollo 11, launched July 16, 1969 the first manned mission to land on the lunar surface. As the mission's command module pilot, Collins orbited the moon while Commander Neil Armstrong and lunar module pilot Edwin E. Buzz Aldrin descended to its surface. In January 1970, Collins resigned from NASA and served as Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs before becoming the first director of the Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum in April 1971. He was promoted to Undersecretary of the Smithsonian in April 1978. During this time, Collins began writing about his experiences in the space program, leading to his book, Carrying the Fire, and a subsequent children's adaptation, Flying to the Moon and Other Strange Places. His expertise and talents led to numerous, er, numerous requests for speaking engagements, articles, and book reviews. In 1988, he published Liftoff a book on the history and future of space exploration. His Mission to Mars was published in 1990. Collins served on the boards of numerous organizations and corporations through the 1970s and 80s. He became vice president of field operations for Vought Corporation in 1980, then resigned to head his own consulting firm, Michael Collins Associates, in 1985. He retired from the Air Force Reserve with the rank of Major General in 1982. Collins awards include the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the Collier, Harmon, and Goddard trophies, the Air Force Distinguished Medal of Medal with Oak Leaf, Oak Leaf Cluster, the Distinguished Flying Cross, and many others. He has received awards from 11 other countries and honorary degrees from six colleges and universities. And uh, not in here because I don't think this has been updated since it happened. Uh, Michael Collins did pass away last year um, in... June, I want to say? I'll have the date for you in just one second. Uh, because I have that information nearby. Uh...
One moment. Oh no, it was in April. Um, it was April 28th of last year He when he uh, did pass away. All right. You're glad you're not the only one who quotes Quaddy's hello, Scotty's Hello Computer when things are unresponsive. Yeah. So what we have here is a folder labeled Michael Collins Speeches January through June 1979. And the reason we have this folder uh, prepared for stream today is there is an item in here about Hubble. Um, so we have... Remarks by Mr. Collins, Einstein Centennial Reception. We've got some handwritten notes here. Welcoming remarks by Mr. Collins, The Joys of Research Colloquium from 1979. Our Future in Space from April of 1979. Presentation of Brewer Trophy to Mr. Collins and National Air and Space Museum by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. And here is the one that I pulled this for. I actually don't know if it's Hubble or not. Um, we'll find out. I know it's space telescope related. Remarks by Mr. Collins, dedication of the multiple mirror telescope, Tucson, Arizona, May 9th, 1979. Rolling over a cord, sorry. Uh, so I do not believe that this will be Hubble-related. Re um, well, let's find out what it's about. The Multiple Mirror Telescope, Tucson, Arizona. We hit that time. Uh, the page I was controlling things with went blank, and I had to I had to fix it. Um, all right, multiple mirror telescope, MMT Observatory. Uh, looks like this is associated with the University of Arizona. The MMT Observatory is a joint facility of the Smithsonian Institution and the University of Arizona, located on the summit of Mount Hopkins, about 50 miles south of Tucson. MMTO hosts the 6.5 meter MMT telescope. Located on the summit of Mount Hopkins, some 50 miles south of Tucson, the MMT Observatory is owned and operated in partnership with the Smithsonian Institution and the University of Arizona. Mount Hopkins, nearly 9,000 feet in elevation, is the second highest peak in the Santa Rita mountain range and an ideal location for operating the observatory. After astronomers from both the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory and the University of Arizona became interested in a multiple mirror telescope, the two institutions signed a memorandum of understanding committing both to collaborate, uh, built in a as a collection of six 1.8 meter mirrors. At the time, it was the third largest telescope in the world. It was also the first telescope to be housed in a rotating building and to be supported on ball bearings rather than hydrostatic bearings. All right. Interesting note at the very end of the description, it says, in 2016, scientists used the MMT to discover the most metal poor galaxy in the observable universe. Um, so this, not a Hubble related item, but it is a space telescope or a telescope related item. So I think it's worth looking at. Uh, plus it's a speech by Michael Collins. So let's take a look and see what his remarks were uh, in the dedication of the MMT in um, Tucson, Arizona. Uh, Dr. Wolf, Dr. Millman, ladies and gentlemen, I am not an astronomer, but it has been my privilege to look out into space, not only from the surface of this planet, but also from the vicinity of our planet's moon. And I'll never forget what I saw. Above the Earth's atmosphere, the stars are incomparably beautiful. 
they appear brighter and they do not scintillate or twinkle. Venus seems as bright as an automobile headlight. Although in astronomical terms, I was only 1.2 light seconds away from Earth, I nonetheless had a powerful urge to do two things, see more of the universe and get back home. I hope you will excuse me when I say I gave first priority, or I first gave priority to the second notion. But the idea of seeing far out into space to look backwards in time with greater clarity has continued to intrigue me. And I'm delighted that I work for an organization which is on the threshold of exciting new discoveries in space, which can now look backwards for billions of years, back almost to the time of the universe's creation. Uh... <laughs> I'm trying to find where it continues because it cuts off this and I don't know. Uh... I think it continues here. Yeah, MMT was a ground-based, but it had a hexagonal mirror away, kind, kind of like the web, yes. So, um, so we won't be going there for Mass Effect to look for resources. <laughs> um, <clears throat> let's see, uh, back almost to the time of the universe's creation. It is fitting, therefore, that this remarkable new in instrument should be dedicated in this centennial year of Albert Einstein's birth, and it is an event in which the Smithsonian Institution takes great pride. Even as we are humbled at our efforts to understand in our own imperfect way the stars and their origins. Um, the great reflectors of this century have shown us that the Milky Way is but one among millions of galaxies in a universe so large that its limits are undefined and indeed may be indefinable. But our thirst for knowledge drives us to push back the limits of our scientific understanding and perhaps nowhere more vigorously than in the field of astronomy. Great progress in this effort has been made in the United States since the era of President John Quincy Adams, who in his 1825 State of the Union message called for the establishment of an astronomical observatory and who spoke colorfully of observatories as lighthouses in the skies. It was Adams, you may recall, who shepherded through the halls of Congress the legislation which carried the Smithsonian and created the Smithsonian Institution. Our own astrophysical observatory was established nearly, nearly 90 years ago by Samuel Pierpont. Samuel Pierpont Langley, the Smithsonian's third secretary. Langley, a man of great vision, sought to expand the science by turning it to the examination of the physical characteristics of celestial bodies rather than merely their positions or motions, to develop, in his words, a new branch of astronomy which studies the sun, moon, and stars for what they are in themselves and in relation to ourselves. In recent years, the search for new knowledge of the skies has been aided immensely by the development of such technological wonders as the diode, the laser, and the computer, which in this case make it possible for the MMT to bring precisely together the images from its six eyes and to analyze the extremely faint light from the most distant galaxies. Um, I don't know exactly if this is how it's supposed to continue, but this is the page order it's got. So it is now, it is very rare that one can be witness to indeed participate in the beginning of a new era. Yet that is what we are doing tonight, witnessing the beginning of an er a new era in astronomy with the opening of the multiple mirror telescope on Mount Hopkins. This revolutionary new kind of telescope is a stunning achievement for the Smithsonian Institution and the University of Arizona. Although as a region of the Smithsonian and a senator from Arizona, I obviously have more than a casual interest in the project. My enthusiasm and pride is not entirely parochial and chauvinistic since the MMT has a broader significance for the state, the nation, and the international scientific community. 
First, we should remember that the MMT represents the latest addition to the host of astronomical facilities that have been developed in Arizona during recent decades. Astronomers have long realized that the skies of the American Southwest are dark and clear, and that the climate, with the exception of this year perhaps, is perfect for astronomical ob observations, beginning with the founding of the Lowell Observatory at Flagstaff in 1896, Arizona has become the preferred location for many major American observatories. Tonight, with the addition of the MMT, Tucson has become the undisputed astronomical capital of the world. There are perhaps more telescopes and more astronomers within 50 miles of this podium than anywhere else at any time in history. In fact, a goodly number of the astronomers are sitting right here in this room. Uh, most of these facilities are world famous. The Kitt Peak National Observatory, the University's Mount Lemmon site, the Mount Hopkins Observatory, and the facilities of the Stewart Observatory, the McGraw-Hill Observatory, and the National Radio Astronomy Observatory located on, Count on Kitt Peak. In turn, these facilities have attracted still other specialists in support of astronomy so that the university has developed one of the nation's best... And he goes on. Um, interesting. So, uh, I'm not certain. I would have to dig a little bit to just really understand. Um, this is the first of his, like, speeches that I've actually, like, looked at, so I don't know. Um, it does appear that this was typed, and then he made corrections. Um, I'm guessing that's uh, I'm guessing it was primarily prepared by a speechwriter because um, he was a senator and an administrator for the Smithsonian Institution. It would be very unlikely that he wrote his speeches all himself. Um, so I would guess that this was put together by a speechwriter and then edited, um, which is why we've got the handwriting and the crossouts. Um, there are handwritten notes um, on our, the backs of a couple of the pages. Um, but pretty cool. I was not, um, I find astronomy and such fascinating, but I haven't spent a lot of time like really looking at it. So I'm actually learning a lot about our observational capability today that I didn't already know, uh, because beyond like movies like Contact or, uh, when the, the like reading about the Hubble launching or stuff like that, it's not something I pay a lot of attention to. It's not my area of expertise. I'm an archivist, not, um, not an astronomer. So this is all really fascinating to me because I find the topic interesting, but it's not something that I have devoted many hours of personal study and research time to. Um, so I find it really fascinating. Um, these are directly Hubble related though. So I do want to, I think, I think we'll probably end with these unless, let me look here at these. Uh... Actually, that one would be good. What's this one? Okay, that one, that one, no. That one's not directly NASA related. This one, however, before we look at Marjorie Rhodes Townsend, because as I said, we've looked at Marjorie Rhodes Townsend before. Um, let's look at this one from Phillips. Uh, I'm gonna find this collection so I can get the full name of it, MS. 2005-019. All right. This collection is the William Hewitt Phillips autobiography, circa 1995. Um, William Hewitt Phillips, known more familiarly as Hewitt Phillips, was born in Merseyside, England in 1918, but moved with his parents at age two to the United States. He studied aeronautical engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, uh, obtaining an SB degree in 1939 and an SM in 1940. In July 1940, Phillips entered commence, er, entered 
Phillips commenced service with the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, NACA, uh, where he was assigned to the Flight Research Division at Langley Research Center, Hampton, Virginia, specializing in the study of aircraft flying qualities and stability. Within this broader assignment, Phillips' task involved the improvement of World War II military aircraft flying qualities. Following the war, Phillips' research related to the development of jet-powered fighter airplanes, supersonic airplanes, stability augmentation, and its effect on pilot control, automatic control, and gust alleviation. In 1947, Phillips had married uh, Viola Oler, then head of Langley's editorial office. The couple had three children. Um, as the U.S. space program commenced, Phillips became chief of the Space Mechanics Division, supervising research in the areas of space rendezvous, navigation, and lunar landing, and developing flight simulators for the Gemini and Apollo programs. To train astronauts for lunar landings, Phillips developed the Lunar, lunar Landing Facility. He later served as an analyst and consultant in the development of the Space Shuttle. Phillips retired from NASA in February 1979, but continued in the position of Distinguished Research Associate, performing original research on solar-powered aircraft, propellers, airfoil design, and wind tunnel studies of the use of canard surfaces for the space shuttle. Um, and Autobiography, typescript draft of he William Hewitt Phillips, NACA and NASA Langley Research Center Aerospace Engineer, Okay, but this is definitely not, I'm uncertain. Uh, so this is a folder titled Orbiting Telescope, 1964-1965. So let us start in April of 1964 maybe, Let's see what we've got. Yep. So we have a letter here from someone. <laughs> it's a letter from someone. Are you surprised? Uh, actually, this might be like a more of a memo than a letter. Uh, okay, so this is from um, Hewitt Phillips, April 1st, 1964. Langley Research Center to the Associate Director, Chief Space Mechanics Division. Suggestions for the Orbital Astronomical Telescope. Reference J.W. Fecker Division, uh, American Optical Corporation Final Report, Feasibility Study of a 120-inch Orbiting Astronomical Telescope, AE 1148, NASA contract number NAS 1-130518. The design of an orbiting astronomical telescope presents two main problem areas. Namely, production of a large diffraction limited mirror and optical systems, and the pointing of the telescope with sufficient accuracy for long exposure times. This memorandum pre uh, presents some thoughts on methods to solve these problems. While these ideas are not original, they are believed to offer advantages which have been overlooked previously and which should be included for investigation in future studies of the orbiting astronomical telescope. The production of large mirrors with the desired dimensional tolerance of about 1 20th wavelength of light has not yet been accomplished. The study given in, this, in the reference report indicates that the desired accuracy might be obtained by use of very heavy and rigid mirror construction. However, this approach requires very long construction time and undesirable weight for space application. Further complications are introduced by the need to retain the shape of the mirror in going from 1G where it is constructed to 0G in space. Difficulties also arise from the effects of thermal gradients on the mirror and optical systems during long photographic exposure times. Control of the mirror shape and other critical tolerances of the optical system through closed loop control systems appears to offer a solution to these problems and may allow the use of much lighter and less rigid components than conventional methods. In addition, construction time might be saved through the use of thinner mirror blanks and less accurate initial finishing. A sketch of the proposed control system is shown in figure one. The mirror is supported by a flexible mount either at its rim or at a given radial station and is supported by a number of springs which 
uh, each one of which has its length controlled by a servo actuator. A device or set of devices to detect the shape of the mirror is also provided. These devices would presumably incorporate some of the techniques presently used in the initial checking of mirror shape and would have to provide a sufficient number of independent measurements to determine the displacement or slope of the mirror surface at a number of locations. Uh, the system is arranged so that when errors are detected by the measuring devices, signals are transmitted to the actuators in the correct pattern so the errors are reduced to zero and the mirror assumes its desired shape. So, this is a memo from April of 1964 that is talking about how to work with a mirror on a satellite that is similar to Hubble, uh, where you've got one large mirror and they're trying to make sure that it maintains a standard shape while it's in orbit, while it's exposed for long periods of, ex of like long exposure times for taking of pictures. So this is like 20 years before Hubble actually launches and they're talking about what the technical challenges are for developing a space telescope that incorporates a mirror of the type that was actually used on Hubble. Um, <laughs> topological even. <laughs> Puddle glove, yeah. Um, and and so this is this is the lead up to Hubble. This is the path that got them there. This is 20 years before, and they're working on development of what would eventually become Hubble and go into space. And it was designed, Hubble launched with an expected lifetime of 15 years. It launched in 1985, right? 1985? Now I have to double check my, uh, my actual facts because my brain just said, is that correct? Uh, <laughs> 1990, sorry, it launched in 1990. Um, so 90 to 2000, 2000 to 2010, 2010 to 2020, to 2022, <laughs> 32 years. Thirty-two years. Ninety to two thousand, two thousand to two thousand ten, two thousand ten to two thousand. Yeah, thirty-two years, uh, with a design life of fifteen, and it's still going. And I know me as a child of the. 80s and 90s. I grew up in the 80s and 90s. The thing that always sprung to mind for me with Hubble was that it was broken. Because the media made such a big fuss over that there was something wrong with the Hubble t telescope. And so that was, that's what always stuck in my brain. But it launched, it's been there for 32 years and it's still working. Because they did a mission to go and fix it and we get glorious images from it. But 30 years before it launched, or 26 years before it launched, <coughs> they were developing the, uh, the technology to actually make it function. Um, so it's not like a project that they just threw together they knew what they were doing. They had spent decades developing the tech to get it up there and make sure that it would work. Um, and we have that documentation right here. It's in space. What did they think was going to happen? <coughs> uh, June 8th, 1964. At present, a wide angle lens is used to photograph a scene. Then the scene is projected through an identical lens into a spherical screen and observed by a person near the center of the screen. The spherical screen, because of its large distance from the observer, requires a projection lamp or other light source of high intensity. In general, direct optical transmission from the model to the observer is not feasible because of this limitation. 
It is proposed to replace the effect of the spherical screen by a lens system which would cause the rays from an enlarged image of the picture to converge on the observer's eye. At the same time, the lens would remove the distortion introduced by the, the original wide-angle lens. Possibly, the viewing device could be attached to the observer's helmet. In any case, it should be a fairly compact unit. This system would allow rapid simulation of problems requiring a wide field of view without the need to construct a special cockpit. The lower light intensity required might allow direct optical transmission from the scene to the observer. Okay. Not sure exactly how that relates to the telescope, but... Yeah, working, keeping things working in space is hard. Um, NASA has an excellent track record for well exceeding the design life of uh, of their machines. Um, most things that they put up in space last far longer than they were intended to. Um, I mean, the Voyager missions. Just look at Voyager. <laughs> it was never supposed to last as long as it had. We were not supposed to still be getting transmissions from it, but we are, and it's amazing. Um, so I just, I think this is pretty cool that they've got, we've got these materials here from the 60s that are very clearly linked to the ultimate development of what became the Hubble Space Telescope and the kind of mirror system that was on, used on it. Um, we do have, like I said, Marjorie uh, Rhodes Townsend here. Um, I have a deployment pre-launch mission operation report for the Hubble Space Telescope and a Hubble Space Telescope first servicing mission contingency plan. We definitely looked at the contingency plan on the Marjorie Rhodes Townsend stream. Um, how about we take a look at the uh, deployment pre-launch mission operation report. Um, before I do that, I will give you some background on Marjorie. Uh, yeah, they're engineered to death, and then post-mortem reports are done, and those are engineered to death. Yes. And they're very expensive projects, and they're well worth the money. We get so much from them. Um, All right, I've almost got the bio up. Marjorie Rhodes Townsend. Um, see, we've done, we've talked about her a few times before. So she was the first woman to earn an engineering degree from George Washington University, uh, earning a Bachelor of Electrical Engineering in 1951. Um, she be her career began with eight years at the Naval Research Laboratory where she worked on sonar research. In 1959, she moved to NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center where she worked until 1980. Noted for her project management skills, she oversaw three satellite launches from foreign locations. She was project manager for all three small astronomy satellites and for the Applications Explorer missions. So the small astronomy satellites, um, one of those was named Uhuru, which we saw mention of earlier in this stream. Uh, she was granted a patent for a digital telemetry system that was aboard the Nimbus satellite. Her last five years at NASA included responsibility for all advanced mission planning for future scientific and applications satellites, as well as NOAA's meteorolog meteorological satellites. After her retirement, she worked for private aerospace companies and provided consulting services to NASA and other aerospace entities. Um, so we've got uh, some stuff here from missions that she worked on relating to the Hubble telescope. Uh, oh, one of your favorite YouTube videos was one where a guy uh, who works at JPL in Pasadena played Kerbal Space Program for an hour. Uh, it was edited down, but his insights were fun and he actually landed something on an alien planet in the game. Awesome, Puddle Glum. It is really fun. Um, to see actual scientists kind of play some of these science video games. Um, since we're on Twitch, I, I will just mention that as a thing. Um, one of the, I, I haven't seen her uh, streaming in a while, but one of the scientists that I actually really enjoyed um, watching was um, Dr. Aaron Mack. Uh, 
She is a science consultant for Star Trek um, and an actual astrophysicist. Um, uh, it's uh, Dr. Erin McDonald, and her channel is Dr. Erin Mack. And um, it's, it, it's fun and interesting to watch her play. I think I watched for a while while she was playing the Mass Effect series, and so um, playing the video game, commenting on the video game, and talking about like scientific realism in science fiction video game environments. Um, quite an interesting stream to watch. Um, plus she's pretty cool and awesome and fun and is a science consultant for Star Trek, which is just amazing and awesome. Uh, anyway, um, Marjorie Rhodes Townsend, uh, we have here, like I said, this is the um, deployment pre-launch mission operations report for the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, this is a report from March 2nd, 1990. Um, from E. Associate Administrator for Space Science and Applications, Subject Space Transportation System, STS-31, Hubble Space Telescope, Deployment Pre-Launch Mission Operation Report. Enclosed for your information is the pre-launch uh, mission operation report, which covers the Hubble Space Telescope deployment mission. The HST, an optical telescope of exquisite quality, will be placed in a 330 nautical mile orbit by the Space Shuttle Discovery. Following several months of orbital verification and calibration, the Hubble Space Telescope will be declared operational and then made available for use by the International, Astronom Ast the International Astronomical Community. This mission operation report describes the objectives of the Hubble Space Telescope mission, provides a discussion of the mission develop deployment, verification and calibration sequences, uh, provides a brief description of the observatory and its scientific instruments, and the ground operations elements required to support its launch, deployment, verification, and science operations. Hubble Space Telescope is the first in a family of great observatories to be launched by NASA over the remainder of this century, uh, that being the 20th century. <clears throat> The second, the Gamma Ray Observatory, is expected to be launched later this year. Each of these complementary observatories will view the universe in a different region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Together, these great observatories will enable the international science community to study astronomical objects in ways never before possible. Oh yeah, Puddle, go ahead and um, put the link in the Discord. It'd be fun. So, how about we look at the mission objectives for the Hubble Space Telescope? That sounds like something fun and interesting to look at for the uh, end of stream today. So the mission objectives of the Hubble Space Telescope mission. The ultimate success of the Hubble Space Telescope mission will be judged on the basis of its performance as a long-term, 15-year, international observatory with many different scientific goals and observational modes, and with the capability of maintenance and replacement of critical components and scientific instruments. The initial performance of the Hubble Space Telescope Observatory will be successful if by the end of the first year, the three core instruments, wide field planetary camera, faint object spectrograph, and fine guidance sensors are operating close to or better than their published specifications. At least two of the other major scientific instruments, faint object camera, high speed pho photometer, high resolution spectrograph operate close to or better than their published specifications and the observatory has achieved an average of 20% observing efficiency, two thirds of the long-term goal of 35% on target time. So those were the objectives. Run for 15 years and work pretty well. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely uh, met the 15 years. The Hubble Space Telescope is a very high quality optical telescope system designed to operate in Earth orbit. 
It is a full diameter payload, approximately 43 feet, 13.1 meters, long with a diameter of 10 feet, 3.05 meters at the forward end and 14 feet, 4.27 meters at the aft end. Weight at launch will be approximately 25,000 pounds, 11,355.4 kilograms. In principle, it is no different than the reflecting telescopes invented by the Guillaume Cassegrain and or invented by Guillaume Cassegrain and James Gregory in the 17th century. It will be launched from the Kennedy Space Center in a space transportation system orbiter and placed in a 330 nautical mile, 611 kilometer, orbit above the Earth. I find this sentence kind of interesting. In principle, it is no different than the reflecting telescopes invented in the 17th century. So we just took one of those ground-based telescopes and put it in space. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope was just developed by NASA and its European partner in space, the European Space Agency, under the direction of the Astrophysics Div Division of the Office of Space Science and Applications at NASA headquarters. The Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama has been responsible for the design, development, fabrication, and assembly of the telescope. The Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland managed the development of four of the science instruments and is responsible for the management of the Space Science Telescope Institute STSCI. Uh, it will also operate the telescope following launch. The European Space Agency has played a significant role in development of the telescope by providing the power producing solar arrays and one of the science instruments. Er, the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas is training crews for the launch, deployment, and maintenance of the HST and will be in charge of space shuttle mission operations. The Kennedy Space Center in Florida will ready the telescope for flight and provide launch services using the space shuttle. The HST is a free-flying spacecraft designed for on-orbit maintenance to provide extended spacecraft life and maximum scientific return. Because the HST is a large light-gathering instrument and optical performance is near diffraction limited, scientists will be able to observe the universe with unparalleled clarity out to distances never before attained, detecting objects 25 to 50 times fainter with resolution 7 to 10 times better than ever before possible. The HST should dominate astronomical research for the rest of this century and the early years of the 21st century. I think it did. I think it has. I'm talking a little bit about how it will be launched. Um, now, here it's going to talk about uh, <laughs> check and check, check. 20% of the 21st century is pretty darn good. Yeah. Um, the Space Telescope Science Institute, operated by the Association of Universities for Research in Astronomy, located at the John Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, will be responsible for the telescope's observing agenda. In response to requests from scientists all over the world, astronomers associated with the Institute are generating the telescope's observing plan. The Institute scientists will engage in their own research and distribute telescope data to other scientists. Targets will be picked from an approved list of proposals selected annually by a peer process under the direction of STSCI. The telescope will be maneuvered to view each selected target. Light from the target will be reflected from the 2.4 meter 94.5 inch diameter primary mirror surface to a small 0.3 meter 12.2 inch secondary mi uh, mirror, which images the target in a focal plane where one of six separate scientific instruments will record image characteristics. These measured data will be converted to digital form and transmitted as telemetry data to the ground for evaluation and analysis by the requesting astronomers. HST's long operational lifetime planned for 15 years is required for the program science objectives and is possible because the shuttle can bring maintenance crews and replacement components to the telescope. Skylab and the Solar Maximum Repair mission proved that orbital replacement of components can be effectively accomplished if properly planned and that emergency repairs can be accomplished by a suited crewman in the space environment. 
most HST critical components whose failure could cause loss of the mission of the mission are redundant. The design approach is backed up by by planned use of EVA mission or EVA astronauts who will replace failed or worn out components. Servicing missions will generally fall into one of three categories. The first category of servicing missions uh, will involve the planned periodic replacement of subsystems or instruments. The second uh, mission category involves reboost to place the HST in a higher altitude orbit using the STS. Depending upon solar activity extremes, up to three reboosts may be required over the 15-year expected observatory lifetime. The third mission category will be a contingency or emergency repair mission, which will be called up to replace a component if the survivability of the HST is in serious doubt. This class of mission would be an emergency nature and could be accomplished within one year of call-up by the administrator. HST is one in the family of great observatories to be launched by NASA over the rest of this century. Each of these complementary observatories will view the universe in a different part of the spectrum. With improvements in sensitivity and resolution far beyond their predecessors, the great observatories will enable scientists to study astronomical objects in more detail than ever before and with unprecedented synergism. Together, the great observatories will produce a golden age of astronomy. Cool. So, I think that puts us at 4.31 p.m. Eastern time here, um, which is time for the stream to end. And I think that that was actually a good spot to leave off um, for today. I hope that you found this interesting. Uh, I hope that um, this was sufficient to kind of celebrate the um, launch and deployment of the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, I know it's an exciting event for me. Uh, about six months from now, we're expected to get our first images back. Um, and that's gonna be a new, big, wonderful thing to happen. Um, so I definitely enjoy sharing sort of like the NASA materials that we have. Um, and I hope that you enjoy it too. <laughs> oh, I'm glad that you had fun. Um, so next week, I don't know 100% exactly what I will be sharing on stream. Um, I do know I am sharing materials related to botany next week. Um, I have suspicions. Give me one second and I can give you a hint. Uh, ooh, where did it go? Nope. Um, and no, not Botany Bay. I am I'm not talking Star Trek. I'm not talking um, The Wrath of Khan. I'm talking actual botany. I was looking at sharing uh, two collections, um, one that has papers about botany and one that is mostly images so that we don't have just text all stream or just images all stream. I'm looking at the Stockton Mosby McMurrin scrapbook, um, which is a scrapbook of mostly images from uh, 1909, and the George Myron Shear papers, um, which is a collection of uh, papers, including correspondence and published writings of Virginia Tech plant pathologist and physiologist George Myron Shear, um, which includes correspondence between him and the laboratory of Thomas A. Edison. Uh, so that is what I have planned for next week. Um, we will be looking at two collections related to the topic of botany. Um, and then uh, going forward, as I look towards the rest of 2022, um, I'm looking at possibly the end of January, looking at the freeze textile plant. Um, and into February, uh, looking at the Carter and Cash family collection. And yes, that is related to Johnny Cash. Um, and then possibly the Otis Jerome Parker papers, BP Blazing Game, which would be a return to NASA. Um, and looking far out into the future, sometime in early June, we're gonna look at um, a celebration that was held 25 or held in 1982 about the 25th anniversary of Fortran. Uh, so um, 
those are some things to look forward to as we move forward into 2022. I'm going to look and see who is available for us to raid. Um, also, hi, Orangitis. I see you there. Uh, thank you for stopping by. We are just ending for the day. Um, yeah, and, and just because they are always a great stream to raid into and um, they are uh, have an educational mission similar to what I, I like to raid into a nice little chill educational stream. Um, let's see, what are we looking at today? The Ocean Sea Cam at the Monterey Bay Aquarium is where we're going to go. Um, so today it looks like lots of fish on, on the, on the view today. Um, But I, I do love the Monterey Bay Aquarium's streams. They are quite chill and offer a nice wind down um, at the end of the day for us here, um, but also just good background to have if you're working. Um, again, I hope that I see you as we move forward um, into the year. Uh, stop back next week for some interesting botany stuff or join us later in the year for other topics as we continue on this archival adventure. <laughs> 